from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. The British Prime Minister Theresa May says she will formally resign on June 7th after her latest attempts to salvage her Brexit plan collapsed. She made the announcement a few hours ago outside her residence at Downing Street. However, she will remain as acting Prime Minister until her Conservative Party chooses a new leader, probably in July. May had little choice but to resign after members of her own cabinet forced her to suspend her fourth attempt to get Parliament to vote for her agreement with the European Union. The Prime Minister broke into tears as she finished her statement. I tried three times. I believe it was right to persevere, even when the odds against success seemed high. But it is now clear to me that it is in the best interests of the country for a new Prime Minister to lead that effort. So I am today announcing that I will resign as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party on Friday the 7th of June, so that a successor can be chosen. I've agreed with the party chairman and with the chairman of the 1922 committee that the process for electing a new leader should begin in the following week. I have kept Her Majesty the Queen fully informed of my intentions and I will continue to serve as her Prime Minister until the process has concluded to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. The opposition Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said May had been right to resign. Seven or more Conservative figures are likely to stand to replace her. The favourites include Boris Johnson, are, and he's likely to push for Britain to leave the European Union, even without an agreement. Our correspondent in London, Pablo Navarrete, has the latest. This Friday morning, British Prime Minister Theresa May resigned in a teary statement made in front of Tang Downing Street, her residence in central London. To journalists, she defended her record, uh, said that she'd ultimately be unable to deliver on Brexit uh, and uh, called on her successor to bring the country together. Now, as I said, she ended in a teary fashion, saying that it had been an honour for her to be Prime Minister. Uh, what happens next is that she will stay in place till the 7th of June, which means that she will oversee the state visit by Donald Trump between the 3rd and the 5th of June. And on the 7th, she will uh, no longer be British Prime Minister and a process will begin to look for her replacement from within her party. Now, the uh, leader of the opposition of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, tweeted that it was the correct decision, but that the what was needed now was a general election as the government had shown themselves incapable of uh, uniting the country. Now, in terms of who will take over, um, the front runners are Boris Johnson, the former foreign minister, who resigned uh, from Theresa May's front bench. Now he is uh, liked by the party base. Uh, he's seen as a populist, as a maverick, although he has numerous controversies that surround him uh, as a former mayor of London and as a politician that's been around. Um, and he is not popular within the Conservative Party uh, MPs. Another is Dominic Rabb, who was Brexit Minister, who also resigned, one of the many uh, ministers who resigned under uh, May's Premiership. Now he, um, uh, and another one is the current Foreign Minister, Jeremy Hunt, although some are saying it would simply be Theresa May with trousers. So um, Theresa May has resigned. The government, what was widely expected to happen, has finally happened. Uh, Britain continues to be in a state of sort of paralysis politically with the Brexit negotiations uh, unable to be, the Brexit agreement unable to be passed through Parliament and the date now uh, scheduled for Brexit uh, in October. Um, so whether we will get to October without a general election remains to be seen. Two years ago, um, for the general election, people were talking about May uh, June being the end of May was a slogan that was used by those opposed to May. So two years later, it finally does appear that that 
um, this has occurred. That was Paula Navarrete from London. But some in the UK are saying that May's resignation still leaves the whole Brexit process in doubt. It doesn't change the numbers, it, it doesn't you know, change the mess we're in and that Parliament can't make a decision. Um, even if we get a pro-Brexit uh, Prime Minister, what are they going to do that's going to change? The EU have stated quite categorically there is no time for any more negotiations. I don't know about benefiting the Brexit process. I think it's. Uh, I think she probably should have gone quite a while ago. Um, I think the whole government generally has been in a bit of a state of limbo. Um, and uh, I do think that uh, the whole Brexit process is probably still going to take a while by the looks of it. Uh, now let's go live to Telesur's political analyst Tariq Ali in London to discuss what's next in British politics. Thank you for joining us, Tariq. So where does May's resignation leave the Conservative Party and how do you see the election of a new leader playing out? Well, I, I predicted soon after the Brexit referendum uh, that the Conservative Party was likely to suffer and might even split. And I think what we are, in fact, uh, observing is a de facto split in the Conservative Party. This is largely a party where the average age of the membership is between 55 and 60. Very few young people are joining uh, this party. Uh, and it's a party in its death throes, literally, I mean, biologically, but now also politically. A number of Conservative members of Parliament have said that if Boris Johnson is elected leader, they will resign from the Conservative Party and obviously move to some sort of centrist uh, uh, formation. But it is, you know, one has to say, a huge crisis for the British ruling class. They've had three years to come up with a plan to implement the referendum, which was, after all, voted in by a majority. I mean, over 17 million people voted to quit the EU. Instead, a bulk of the establishment has been working on ways to stop, uh, find ways to stop implementing this, looking for magic solutions, coming up with concessions to the EU which make the referendum largely irrelevant, to be perfectly frank. Uh, so I think Corbyn calling for a general election is absolutely correct. The Tories, they insisted on a referendum. They pushed a referendum through. They have not been able to deliver on the results of the referendum. And they are now in a very deep crisis. And the main reason that David Cameron, the former prime minister, wanted a referendum was for internal reasons of the Conservative Party. He wanted to crush the Eurosceptics and the Brexiters for all time. And the establishment was so convinced it was going to win the referendum that it was not prepared for the uh, defeat uh, uh, that it suffered. And now the country has been paying the price for this. I mean, enormous amounts of monies uh, have been wasted uh, uh, on, on, on this whole business. And I think we need a new government to bring this process to an end, to end the divide between those who voted for uh, quitting and those who voted to remain, because there are many, many real problems Britain confronts. I mean, the country socially, economically, and now politically is in a deep crisis. There's no conservative government that's going to be able to solve it. And if we look at the EU elections which are happening right now, polls suggest that the new Brexit party led by the right wing Nigel Farage could come first in these elections. Do you think that will build momentum for leaving the EU without a deal? Well, it, it's difficult to predict that. But I would point out that the European elections aren't taken too seriously uh, in this country uh, and in many other parts of the EU. Um, basically, I mean, when I went to cast my vote for Labour yesterday, there were three other people voting. Uh, and when I asked the people manning the polling booth, how many had voted, they just smiled. I mean, they said, we've had a very easy time. So I think the vote will be low. And given this, 
I think it's it's very possible that many people who are angry with the failure to implement the referendum will vote Farage as a protest vote against the establishment. If this happens, he will be the largest party in the European Parliament, which, I mean, there are so many ironies here that it's that we don't have time to go into all of them. But the main impact of Farage in the European elections will be to make, it, I think, to more or less ensure that Boris Johnson is elected leader of the Conservative Party, to just be completely objective. He is the only Conservative politician in the country who could take on a Farage and deal with him and try and win back some Conservative uh, uh, supporters back. And he won't be an easy right for Labour either. Uh, because he is capable of witticisms and puncturing. Uh, you know, he punctures himself sometimes, but he can also puncture uh, others. So I think Labour will have to fight on its program, its manifesto, which no one can compete with in the British uh, political market at the moment, and start campaigning from now. I mean, not wait for Boris to be elected leader. The com Conservatives would be crazy, in my opinion, if they went for a nondescript leader like Dominic Raab. Uh, leave alone Jeremy Hunt, who's pretty well disliked uh, in the country as a whole. And the majority of Conservative Party members want Boris. Uh, so I think we will probably have a Boris Johnson uh, prime ministership uh, fairly soon. And then we have to have an election sooner than 2020, I would have thought. There's a very strong case uh, for going to the country now. So I think if Johnson is elected leader, becomes prime minister, Labour should move a series of no confidence votes and see how Johnson's opponents within the Conservative Party will vote. And Tariq, we also saw the figure of Jeremy Corbyn as a very strong one during the debates. And its Labour Party refused to compromise with May on her deal. It, could that be a possibility of Labour being a stronger position now? Well, I think it's good they didn't do a deal with May. That would have been seen by large numbers of Labour supporters as an abdication of their role as an opposition party. Uh, there was no way May was going to agree with all the Labour demands uh, but, uh, without you know, completely isolating herself, which she's managed to do. Even the fact she negotiated with, with Corbyn helped to isolate her inside the party. But I think Corbyn is in a strong position <clears throat> Excuse me. I think Corbyn is in a strong position, uh, provided his own parliamentary party uh, decides to back him and not start leaking stuff against him, not weakening Labour by attacking him nonstop, etc. There will be, I think, attempts to remove Jeremy Corbyn yet again before the next general elections, but let's hope they fail and let's hope they see sense. There are many Labour MPs who would rather Labour lost the election than see Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. And this narrow-minded sectarian factionalism will not do Labour any good. But I think Corbyn's big strength is that he's the only Labour politician with a huge mass appeal, uh, not simply to people of his generation, but to young people as well. And winning the youth to his side uh, during this campaign will be very crucial. Thank you very much, Tariq, for helping us understand what's going to happen in British politics. And it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. That was political analyst Tariq Ali. Now we go to other news. Voting has begun in Ireland and the Czech Republic on the day two of the European Parliament elections. Voters are casting their ballots after a campaign dominated by concerns over Britain's attempt to, to leave the bloc. Britain and the Netherlands voted yesterday with an exit poll showing a surprising result with the Netherlands left-wing Labour Party on course for victory. The rest of the EU will cast its ballots over the weekend before results begin to be published late on Sunday. We have more stories coming up, so don't go away.
The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. Moments that you can live in. Telezul Documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telezul. Welcome back. The U.S. Justice Department has announced 17 new charges against the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Assange is still being held in detention in London after he was dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy in April. He had taken asylum there since 2012. The United States is already seeking his extradition on one count of disclosing classified documents. The 17 new charges relate to violations of the Espionage Act. Each carries a maximum sentence of between five and ten years. Our correspondent Alina Duarte has more on Assange's case. Muy buenas tardes, así es el fundador de Wikileaks, Julian Assange. Wikileaks co-founder Julian Assange faces 17 new criminal charges which allege that he conspired with former Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning to obtain and publish secret in 2010. The charges include the violation of the Espionage Act, which has prompted press freedom advocates to criticize the move, calling it a breach of the First Amendment of the Constitution relative to free speech and a free press. The 17 counts include one count of conspiracy to receive national defense information. Assistant Attorney General The Justice Security official said Julian Assange is no journalist and that no responsible actor, journalist or otherwise, would publish the names of individuals he or she knew to be confidential sources. The U.S. State Department is accusing Assange of aiding and abetting Manning with stealing U.S. files and recklessly endangering confidential sources in the Middle East and China to benefit a foreign country. Assange is currently in London fighting extradition. If found guilty of the 17 charges, he can be jailed for close to 170 years. WikiLeaks has said that this is a threat to journalism and the First Amendment. Some media professionals are questioning what this sentence could mean for other journalists who will or have published confidential information. That was Alina Duarte, our correspondent. And international organizations have sent a letter to Ecuador's foreign minister questioning the detention of Swedish software developer Olabini. Bini was arrested in April after being linked to Julian Assange. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, has a story. Several international organizations fighting against the arbitrary detention of Swedish software developer Olabini have published a letter addressed to Ecuador's foreign minister, Jose Valencia. They are concerned about the legal process that Bini is facing in Ecuador. The country's prosecutor's office accuses Ola Bini of attacking the integrity of the national information system. The request made by the UN and the Inter-American Commission is very important because what they express in that letter is very concerning. The hearing to request bail for Ola Bini was set for May 23. However, it was delayed. Bini's lawyer questioned this decision. They say the prosecutor in charge of this case left the country after being ordered by the prosecutor's office to work on Julian Assange's investigation in London. They believe Ecuadorian authorities are trying to link Ola Bini to that case. Unfortunately, the judge violated once again the rights of a detained person and said that the hearing must be delayed another week until the prosecutor in charge comes back to the country. They are trying to link us to Julian Assange again without a proper file. Meanwhile, national and international organizations are still supporting Olavini and rejecting the actions taken by Ecuadorian authorities. 
The Ecuadorian authorities received this letter a month ago, and they still haven't responded. When I talked to Ola, he told me he's worried about the foreign ministry ignoring this, but he also said that he's grateful to the international community, which thinks this case is a persecution. Maybe in the country it has political importance, but from abroad it looks like persecution against someone defending rights. The bail hearing is expected to finally happen on May 29. Olavini's lawyers say they expect to get bail for Ola so he can defend himself as a free man. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. Guatemala is preparing for its presidential elections to take place on June 16. The Supreme Electoral Court and political parties have defined ballot designs to be used in the elections. The country faces an unusual situation after the two leading candidates were banned from running. Former Attorney General Telma Aldana was banned due to corruption allegations, while Suri Rios, daughter of the former dictator Efraín Rios Montt, was banned by law for being related to someone responsible of war crimes. This creates a scenario where any candidate that is in the competition has the possibility of reaching a second round. In our 35 years of electoral history, we haven't had a process with these kinds of characteristics where anyone has a chance. Residents in the Brazilian city of Barao de Cocais fear a nearby dam owned by the company Vale may collapse soon. Earlier this week, state environmentalists said a slippage in the embankment at one of Valle's mines could trigger a dam burst. Over 450 residents have already been evacuated from the area. The dam is less than 70 kilometers from Brumandinho, where toxic mud from a dam collapse by the same company killed more than 240 people in late January. On March 14, Mozambique was devastated by Cyclone Idai, which left more than 600 dead and thousands displaced. To provide aid after the tragedy, Cuba sent a group of doctors, and our correspondent, Andre Vieira, traveled with them to see firsthand the humanitarian work. Beira, capital of the province of Sofala, was the area hardest hit by Cyclone Idai. Throughout the central region of Mozambique, over 600 people lost their lives. 90% of the country was affected by winds of more than 200 kilometers an hour. In response, Cuba sent a brigade of 40 health workers to provide assistance. I'm not well and came here to see a doctor. My whole body hurts, my head and my back. Over 20,000 people have been treated by the doctors of the Henry Reeve Brigade since they arrived here. Antonio Manuel lost her home in the cyclone. Ill and with her defenses low, she's one of nearly 300 people who have undergone surgery here. I am feeling well. I was not eating. I could only take water and soup. But now, I no longer have those problems. The day I was operated, I asked my sister to bring me something to eat, and I feel very well now. Beyond helping victims of the cyclone, the Cuban doctors are improving the lives of people who have been suffering ailments before the disaster hit. I had been waiting for two years to have surgery in the central hospital. That's why I came here, to get the surgery I need. And so Antonio Francisco is off to have his operation, something made possible only thanks to the efforts of the Cuban people who have financed all the work of the Henry Reeve Brigade. To the best of our abilities, we have cured many patients who did not have access to medical care, and much less to surgery. There is a phrase our commander-in-chief says that us Cubans will never forget, and it's that by providing aid internationally, we are paying back our debt with humanity. Since it was set up in 2005, the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade has sent over 8,000 Cuban doctors around the world. Here in Mozambique, the land of Samora Machel, the health workers from revolutionary Cuba are on their 28th mission. These are people who are ready to leave everything to help others around the world. We're taking one last break, but stay with us.
Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. On Monday, only on Gerasu. Thank you for joining us again. Vote continues in vote counting continues in Malawi with President Peter Mutarika leading with 40% of the votes. Opposition leader Lazarus Chakwera has so far received 35% of the votes, while Vice President Solos Chidima scooped 18%. Meanwhile, foreign observers issued a preliminary report on the election, saying they saw bias in state media's reporting of the results. Classic Corporation is a public broadcaster, but many stakeholders noted its tendency to favor the incumbent party in its coverage. Politician and former chief spy in Zimbabwe during the liberation struggle, Dumiso Dabengwa, has died at age 79. Nicknamed the Black Russian, Dabengwa died while in Kenya after returning from India where he had gone for medical treatment. Dabengwa was detained for four years in the 1980s, accused of treason, but was later appointed Home Affairs Minister after a peace deal. He later left the ruling party in 2009 to lead an opposition party, we supporting key opposition leaders much. in successive elections. We President Emerson Menangawa has issued a condolence message, calling him a great son of Africa. Say, I decided. The late comrade Dumiso Dabengwa ranks high among a pioneering generation of our early nationalists and freedom fighters whose contributions to the liberation of our country were as enormous as they remain historical. As we mourn his untimely departure, our whole nation is lifted by the story of his life and that of his generation. Following a landmark decision for LGBTQ rights in Asia, Taiwan has started to register its first official same-sex marriages. On Friday, two same-sex couples, one male, one female, were the first to enter the government office in the capital, Taipei, to sign their marriage certificates. This comes as Taiwan became the first country in Asia to legalize gay marriage last week, but the country remains divided over the decision, as opponents announced they will create a new political party to fight for a ban on same-sex marriage at the 2020 election. And with that, we end our news brief. But remember, you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. And be sure to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching. <laughs>